morning everyone it is so lovely to have you in the house of god we are pre-recording tonight on a thursday night and before we get into worship i want to encourage you i love to sing and i love to worship and one of the things god tells us is that he has put a melody in our hearts which means that there is a song in your heart that we need to sing that we desire to sing isn't it amazing when we have a room full of people, a quiet room full of people, and a song that comes on that we all know, when it begins to play, suddenly something that we have in common, the room starts to come alive and becomes festive because we sing, and that singing creates an energy in our lives. God says that we're not just to think and listen about him, but we are to sing. In Psalm 47 verse 3, it says, sing to the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. Sing his praises. And it goes on and it mentions sing, sing, sing for at least five times. So tonight, when we take a moment to worship him, let us sing. Let me remind you that when Moses came out of the, out of the desert through um, the Red Sea, the Israelites sang about their deliverance when the Egyptians were drowned. When, we were, when Nehemiah was building the wall, the people, there was a choir on the wall that were singing and rejoicing while Nehemiah was building the wall. Both David and Moses were songwriters, and they wrote a song, which is, uh, sorry, they wrote a song, and their songs communicated their intimacy with God and their, their relationship with God. So when we get up and when we worship today, we are going to sing because that's going to show God the depth of what is in our hearts towards him. He knows what's in your heart. He just still wants to hear you sing it. So as we stand and let us sing, let us sing, sing to the Lord of all the earth. Amen.
worship you king of kings we magnify your holy name there is none like you lord and we are so grateful that we can honor your name today that we can lift our hands and extol your holy name lord we extol your holy name tonight we extol your holy name father god because you are wonderful and we just reverence in your presence tonight we just reverence in your presence tonight thank you jesus Thank you, and you may be seated. Tonight I have the pleasure of sharing communion with you. And our communion represents our relationship with the Lord. And as we saw in praise and worship, that part of communicating with God is to sing to Him. One of the things we learn that when we sing to the Lord, we move into a place into a moment of time where he can speak into our hearts and reveal to us what he is calling us to. And as he does that, our eyes are enlightened to what it is that he needs to share with us. It takes a concentrated moment, an effort to say, hush, I'm listening to what you are saying, what you are calling me to, Lord. And in doing that, in that moment, his voice whispers to you, and it's when you lean into him that you can hear. So in communion today, we learn that we need to listen in to the whisper of the voice of the Holy Spirit, of what God is saying to you. When in the passage where Elijah, um, where, where God speaks to Elijah, he says, go to the high mountain where you will hear me. He says, go to the high mountain because the Lord is passing by. David said, who can go up the mountain? He who has a pure heart and he who has clean hands, he who has not sold his soul to, the, to idol worship. And so as we realize that none of us are pure before the Lord, except for his blood, except for what his blood has done. We know that David says that, Lord, only you know the heart of man. And so I want you to know that today Jesus knows your heart. He knows what's going in, and he wants you to listen in to what he is saying to you and what he is calling you to, because he has made a place for you at his table. He knew that you would be there. He knew that he had opened up a place for you. And that place allows you to partake in the finished work of the cross, all the gifts that he has given to you through the cross. His blood extends that invitation. Where there is a seat at that table that he has prepared for us, today 
you can take your seat. Today, you can lean in closer to what the Lord of hosts is saying to you. And as he speaks to you, he will reveal to you that which you need to know. But you can only do it when you lean in to hear what the host is saying. And when he speaks softly to you, get ready to be undone in his presence when you see the beauty of who he really is, the beauty of his holiness. And so today as we take, as we partake in the elements, I want you to know that that seat that he has prepared for you is yours. You have been invited to the table. And as we partake of the elements, the blood, the body and the blood that was shed for us, the body which was broken, that healed our diseases and bound up our wounds, was broken for us. And as we partake in the elements, I want you to consider what he has bound up in your life, what he has healed in your life, and to receive that in Jesus' name. As you partake of the blood, I want you to know that the blood cleanses you, it washes you, it, keep, it cleans every part of your heart, where your heart has been soiled with the stain and the sin of the world, he purifies your heart and cleanses you. And so today, we eat and drink, we eat and drink in remembrance of the finished work of the cross. And so, please enjoy. Well, good morning, church. It's so good to be in your homes again this morning, and we want to thank you for the privilege of being in your home today, wherever you are watching or listening around the world. We're so excited because the grace of God is sufficient for us in the moment that we face in our lives. And Mandy, thank you for that beautiful communion this morning. Now today, before we dig into the Word of God, we want to just take this moment to invite you uh, to bring your tithes and your offerings. Remember, we're doing that via EFT. And right now on the screen, you can do it via SnapScan as well. By simply downloading the app on your phone and holding it up to the screen, you'll be able to follow the prompts and so you'll see this morning. And we want to thank everybody who has continued to give faithfully so that we can continue to build the mission and the vision that God has given us as a local church and reach into our community with the love of Jesus Christ. Well, just a couple of things you need to remember. Don't forget that every week now we have uh, online children's church as well that will premiere every Sunday at 8 o'clock. That is for faith kids and for big ch church. So please go and have a look at that. And you can get your children settled down while you have a nice cup of coffee before you join us for our live premiere at 9 a.m. Then don't forget our small groups uh, are also going online on the WhatsApp platform, and we'd like to invite you and even challenge you to become part of what God is doing through our small group network uh, all over the place. And you can connect there, you can get your needs met, and you can also reach out to other people. So if you want to know more, right at the end of the service, there'll be an email that'll come up on your screen. And if you'll just send us an email with your contact details, we'll get one of our leaders to contact you and get you going. And then if you're a youth, if you're a young person and you'd like to join our wildlife ministry, Richard and the team are doing a great job, and uh, they meet every Friday night online. They talk throughout the week, and so you can drop us an email if you'd like to know more about that. Also remember that our offices are now open, and so if you have something you want to drop off, or if you need to come find out anything about uh, what's going on in the church, we're here uh, Monday to Thursday from 8 to 4 o'clock, and then on a Friday from 8 to 2 o'clock. And then, of course, we want to continue to share with you that so far, through the goodness of God and through people's generosity, we've been able to distribute 1,500 food parcels across the South Coast to meet those who are vulnerable, those who are struggling during this difficult time, uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic. We are also trusting God to still supply another 1,700 food buckets to our community. So if you'd like to give into that, if you'll sow into our normal bank account, but market specifically for the food relief project, then we'll make sure that that goes towards that. Well, this morning, uh, we're going to continue in our series called Rejoice, a study 
in the book of Philippians. And I hope you've been enjoying it as much as we have as we've studied the word together. Now today, I want to talk to you about staying encouraged along the journey. Staying encouraged along the journey. Because you see, as life journeys, often things take a lot longer than we plan for. Sometimes there are de detours and roadblocks that we have to go through. And if we don't keep our hearts encouraged, what happens is we become despondent, we drop our heads, we lose our focus, and our faith is replaced by fear. And you know what? We're not going to allow that to happen to us because the grace of God is enough for every single day. So let's dig into the Word of God, and we're going to start today, and uh, God willing, we'll be able to finish Philippians chapter 3, and uh, next week we'll conclude our series as we wrap it up in chapter 4. So let's turn to chapter 3, and we're going to look at the first three verses this morning, and Paul starts off, and he talks about the power of worship and spiritual joy. Now remember, the whole theme of the book of Philippians is all about joy. Paul uses the word uh, joy or rejoice more than 18 times throughout this book. And here in, in uh, verse 1, he starts to speak and he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Sorry, beware of the dogs, beware of evil workers, and beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Paul had come to the realization and he had recognized that rejoicing is actually a spiritual force. We learn that from Nehemiah 8 verse 10 because uh, when, the, when the children of, of God were building the walls and they'd come to realize how far away from God they were. They began to weep and they began uh, to, to be heavy-hearted. They were discouraged. And Nehemiah said, no, 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 this is not a time to be discouraged. This is a time to put on joy. This is a time to rejoice, for the Lord your God is with you. And so I want you to know, Paul had realized that what happens when you and I rejoice, when we make a decision to allow joy to fill our hearts, what happens is it gives us power to stay encouraged during the journey. And so, you see, you and I can learn to celebrate our victories. We can celebrate our victories, but we've got to keep them in perspective. I want you to know not only that, but we can celebrate our trials because they're working for you, not against you. And finally, while we remember this, he says this, never forget that true worship, true worship comes out of your spirit and it's not a fleshly ritual. Paul actually says in verse 2, three times he says, beware, beware, beware. In other words, he says this, when we don't consistently develop joy in our hearts, it's easy for us to move away from walking and living in true worship, and what happens, we get good at being a Christian. We get professional about being a Christian, and so what happens, we can step into a place where we just go through the motions in the flesh, but there's no heart and soul engagement. And I want you to know today that true worship flows out of a heart of thanksgiving. You see, what happens is we can start to rely on our own formulas, on our own structures, and our own programs, rather than the grace of Jesus Christ. Let me give you a story that maybe illustrates this point the best. A preacher fell asleep and he had a dream. And during his dream, he dreamt that he'd passed away, and he was standing in front of the gates of heaven. And as it will happen in make-believe dreams, guess what? He came before the pearly gates and there stood St. Peter. And so St. Peter looked at him and said to him, before I can allow you into heaven, preacher, you've got to tell me what you've done to deserve coming into heaven. St. Peter said to him, I want you to know that we walk, work on a hundred point system. And for you to gain access to heaven, you need to earn 
at least have earned 100 points. Well, the preacher paused a minute and he said proudly, well, I've been a preacher for 47 years. Peter looked at him and answered and said, that's nice, one point. One point, the preacher looked at him, he said, I've been a preacher for 47 years. 47 years of service, he said, that's correct, one point. The minister realized that this was a tough scoring system. And he started to think through the things that he'd done in his life. He said, well, I used to visit the elderly. Peter said, great, one point. You only need another 98. He carried on thinking. He said, well, I I delivered programs and I, I raised up a worship team. He said, okay, that's another two points. You only have another 96 points to go. The preacher realized it was hopeless. And he looked at St. Peter. He said, you know what? I feel absolutely helpless and inadequate And I don't know what I'd do if it wasn't for the grace of Jesus Christ. Peter cracked a big smile. He said, speaking about grace, that far more meets the balance of the points you need. You can come into heaven. You see, it's not our works that earn points. It's living in the grace of Jesus Christ. And when we live in the grace of Jesus Christ, it keeps our hearts tender. Number two You know, Paul goes on in verse 4, and he starts to talk, and he he actually ends verse 3. He says, don't rely on your flesh. And so the second thing Paul starts to talk to us about here, about being encouraged in this journey we're on, is he says this, don't rely on your flesh, and don't abandon true righteousness. In verse 4, he says this, though I also might have confidence in my flesh, if anyone else thinks that he may have confidence in his flesh, I even more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Verse 7, he says, But the things, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. You see, all of us may feel that we have compelling evidence in the flesh of our own achievements, our own credentials, the things we've accomplished for the kingdom of God, the length of time we've been serving God. But Paul says that according to the Jewish law, according to the studies and the pedigree that I come from, I trumped it all. Yet, in coming to Christ and in serving God, in comparison to all he accomplished at the cross, it all means nothing. It all comes to nothing. And he says this, man, you can have everything going for you in the flesh, but if you don't have Christ Jesus in your life, if you don't have the blood of Jesus in your life, it means nothing. And he moves from there, and he says that when we start to understand that, it'll move our hearts towards a holy passion a holy ambition that desires more of God, more of Christ in our lives. And so he goes on in Philippians chapter 3 and verses 8 and 9, and he says this, Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Can you see his holy passion? Can you see that he was chasing after God? That he was more passionate about serving Jesus than about anything else in his life? And in verse 9 he says this, that I may be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which comes from the law, but that righteousness which comes through faith in Christ Jesus. The righteousness which is from God through faith. And I remember just a few weeks ago, we had uh, Isaac Pretorius come and share, and he spoke so powerfully about the righteousness that we're to have established in our lives. You see, we can all get into a place in our lives where we become discouraged, where we start to question what is it all about. When we look at the circumstances that we're facing around us today, the the economy that's that's shattered, uh, the circumstances that people are finding themselves in, it's so easy to become discouraged. 
But I want you to know, I was in a meeting this week and one of the pastors was just sharing from his heart that he's come to this place where, where he just he wonders what it's all about, and he, he was actually at the point of maybe just quitting in a certain area in his life, and he was just talking to us about that, and we finished our meeting, and, and uh, I went to bed that night, and Mandy and I were talking about it, and I just said, you know what, I've got to phone this person tomorrow, and I'm just going to encourage them, because through what they were saying, I realized that there was a discouragement that had come against this person. And you know, when we start to get discouraged, what happens is we start listening to all the other voices. All the negative voices around us seem to get louder. And we don't always realize it's happening in the moment, but it starts to drag our spirit down. It starts to cause us to get lowered. So early in the morning, I woke up and I was just praying and thinking about this person. And the Spirit of God dropped into my heart and He reminded me of the Comrades Marathon. And he reminded me when you're doing the up run, when you get about 79 kilometers into the run and you basically only have about eight kilometers left, you hit a hill that everybody knows as Polly Shorts. It is a long, steep, horrible uphill. And what happens, many people quit on that uphill. But you know what? Most of them get over it. Even on their tired legs and their weary minds, they just know if they can get past that hill, they've only got about six kilometers to go, and so they push themselves that little bit harder. And you know what happens after you get to the top of Polly's? There's this beautiful, slow, winding downhill, and there's this breeze that blows into your face, and you kind of feel like, wow, I've made it. And you go around this corner. As you go around the corner, you hit what they call little Polly's. Now, Little Polly's even, isn't even a hill to talk about. I mean, it's a little mound hill. It's so easy. But you know what? Most people quit on Little Polly's. You know why? Big Polly's took everything out of them. They just didn't realize it. And so when they hit the little bump, they get discouraged and they give up six kilometers from the finish line. Can I encourage you this morning? Can I say to you, don't give up? Because you're just close to your finish line. You're just around the corner from your breakthrough. And if you'll just press on, if you'll just gird your loins, if you'll just rejoice in this moment, you'll see God will carry you through. And I believe if we turn in the Bible, we'll find an encouraging scripture in Matthew 11 verse 28 where Jesus says this, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Just say to yourself, I'm going to get there. The most important thing in life is answered by these three words of Jesus. Come to me. Notice he doesn't say, go do this first. Or you haven't done that yet. Go do that and then come to me. No, when you come to God, in whatever moment you're in, he says this, come in. You're always welcome in my presence. And you know, if you'll just take that step today, if you'll just take that step, you know what will happen? Your life in a moment will experience the lifting of the Holy Spirit and the building of your faith. And what will happen is you'll start to find a harmony and you'll start to connect with what really matters in God's kingdom. What really matters and what you really need for this moment. Can I read these same verses? I'll, I'll read two extra ones in the Passion Translation. In Matthew chapter 11 from verse 28, it says, Are you weary, carrying a heavy burden? Then come to me. I will refresh your life. I am your oasis. Simply join your life with mine. Learn my ways and you'll discover that I am gentle, humble, and easy to please. Wow. Wow. You will find refreshment and rest in me. For all that I require of you will be pleasant and easy to bear. You know, at the most unexpected and most difficult moments in your life, if you'll just be still, we heard it the, uh, tonight in the, in the beginning of worship, if you'll just get still in that moment, you'll hear the Lord's whisper saying, come to me, come to me. 
And if you'll do that, you know what? He will draw you in immediately. I want you to know that same day that I had that conversation with, with this friend of mine, I want you to know it had been a crazy day and, and there was a lot going on. We'd had a, a terrible tragedy earlier in the week in, in, the, in the lives of a family in our church and, and we were planning different things with our food parcels. I just want you to know that that night when I went to bed, I, I felt overwhelmed. I felt not frustrated, but I felt overwhelmed and I felt a bit edgy and I was like, Man, what is going on? And as I slept and I woke up in the morning and I thought about the Comrades Marathon, I remember just saying to myself, man, I just really need a word from the Lord this morning. And you know what happened? I opened my devotional for that morning. I get it on an email every single morning. And as I opened that email, guess what it was? Come to me. I then went to my next devotional that I read of Joyce Meyer. And guess what she was speaking about? Resting and trusting God. And then I went to the next email, uh, to the next devotional, and there was another scripture. And in a matter of four or five minutes, I'd encountered the presence of God, and my spirit was recharged, and I was ready to go up little polys. Don't be discouraged this morning. God is on your side. In the message Bible, it says this of, of Matthew chapter 11. It says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion, come to me, get away with me, and you will recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I'm not talking about taking a rest and going to sleep. I'm talking about the kind of rest that will ignite the power of the Holy Ghost in you like never before, that'll set that fire on light that you'll walk out and people will see the joy, the spring in your step, and the power behind your words, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You see, personal contact with Jesus changes everything. And when that changes, it brings you and I to the place where we become Christ-like. It's a journey. Don't give up. And so Paul goes on in, 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 in chapter 3, verse 10, and guess what he speaks about? He says, man, this holy ambition will lead you and I to the place where we seek Christ-likeness in our lives. That is the true passion and that is the true vision for any believer's life is to become more like him. And in verse 10 he says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and that I might have the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Verse 12, listen to what he says, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has already laid hold of me. I want you to know, and I want to remind you, we shared it at the beginning of this series, Paul was no longer a spring chicken. He hadn't just been serving God for three or four or seven years. He'd been serving God for 25 years. And yet he makes this statement. He says, man, if I can just lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of my spirit. You see, serving God is a journey. It's a marathon. And you know what? The closer to him we get, the further away we are. Because the more we want him. And he goes on in verse 13 and he says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended But one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind, reaching forward to the things that are ahead of me, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Can I say something to us today? Can I encourage us today? Keep pressing in. Keep leaning in. You see, the longer you and I live, the greater the possibility becomes for you and I to be haunted by the words, what if? I'm sure we've all said it. What if I did that? What if I didn't do that? 
And the older we get, the more and bigger possibility that we'd be having that what if. But you know, if you're a follower of Jesus today, if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, that what if doesn't have to be a what if of regret because of your past. It can be a what if that becomes an exciting challenge to see the great future that God has for you. You see, your breakthrough is ahead of you. God's presence is going to increase in our lives. And we'll be able to move forward. We'll be able to go on and reach out to other people and build our lives again. I want to encourage us today with this. What if today you'll let go of what's in your past and you'll begin to press in towards what God has for your future? Can I challenge you today? What if today you decide you're going to press in to what God has in regards to his calling in your life instead of looking back at what's already happened? What if today you decide to press into his love and forgive or let go of that hurt or that offense or start reaching out today towards your better future? Reaching out to that lost person or that person around you that needs prayer or encouragement. Can I pray for us today right in the middle of my sermon? Let's just pray, Lord, we're not going to spend our lives asking what if and never seeing breakthroughs in our lives. I thank you today, Father. We make a fresh commitment. We ask for your grace in this moment that, Father, we're going to pursue you today like never before, and we're excited to see the amazing things you have ahead of us. Number five, Paul drops into verse 15 and he starts to speak about maturity. And uh, number five, I entitled it this, you can rest and arise or you can strive and dive. The choice is yours. He says in verse 15, therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind. Have this attitude. And if anything you think otherwise, God will even reveal this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. You see, Paul starts to speak about maturity. He starts to talk about walking in the things we've received. And, and so you can write this down. This is such an important nugget and principle. Rest is the true sign of maturity in a believer. You see, when you've come to the place where you're done with striving, and you realize that all striving does is break you down, and you start to rest in the comfort and the peace and the joy that God has got this, what it does is it lifts you up, and you start to arise in the midst of whatever you're facing. So rest is the sign of true maturity in a believer. And real maturity causes you and I to walk in the fullness of God to the degree that we have received. How many of you know all of us are at a different place in our walk with God? And what Paul says here, he says, to the level that you've attained, walk in that. And sometimes we don't get new light and fresh revelation in areas of our lives, not because God doesn't have it for us, but because we're not walking in the revelation He's already given us. We're not walking in the breakthrough that He already bought for us. You see, so as you walk in the fullness of God to the degree that you have received, guess what? God starts to fill you up again. God starts to give you fresh revelation of who and what He is. And guess what? Your life goes to the next level and you arise. And then when you walk and you experience more of God, more of God's love, guess what? You get filled and then you arise and you walk in the fullness of that. And then when you're walking in the fullness of that, guess what? God fills you with more love. God fills you with more of Him. And as you experience that, guess what? You get filled up again and you arise and you go to the next level. So don't be discouraged today. God is on your side. Look what Ephesians 3 and verse 19 says in the Amplified. It says that you may really come to know practically through experience for yourselves the love of Christ. 
which far surpasses knowledge without experience, that you may be filled throughout all of your being unto all the fullness of God, may have the richest measure of His divine presence and become wholly filled and flooded with God Himself. Wow. God has more health, more abundance, and more success lined up for your life. As a matter of fact, God has more than enough of everything we need in our lives. How do these things come into our lives? Not by chasing after them, not by striving after them, not even by going after them. They come simply by becoming full of Jesus Christ. It's not about praying longer or fasting every week or doing more for others or showing how much you love God. It's in receiving and knowing the depth of Christ's love for you and I. And when we walk in that love, when we receive that love, I want you to know it fills us and ignites us. You see, God designed you and I to run at a maximum level when we are filled with His love. Just like your motor vehicle doesn't run great on paraffin. It sputters and it jerks. How many you know when you fill it with the right gasoline, with the right petrol, how many you know it functions at its maximum? When you, you and I are full of God's love, when we're walking in joy, guess what? We can function at our maximum level. And when you're full of God, look what happens in verse 20 of Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who, by in consequence of the action of his power that is work within us, is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly far above all that we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, and hopes or dreams. You see, these things will happen supernaturally in our lives when we come and we spend time with our Father. Paul continues. And he starts to speak in verse 17, and he talks about number six. He warns us against carnality. He warns us against relying on the flesh in the first part of chapter three. And then in the second part of chapter three, he speaks about that if we keep walking in the flesh, what happens is we become carnal Christians, and we're separated from the life of the Spirit. And now we're walking in carnality. And he says here in verse 17, he says, brethren, Join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us as a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and I tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross and of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame who set their minds on earthly things." You see, the way to stay away from carnality is simply to stay ahead of it. Stay ahead of it. In 1 Peter 5, verses 8 to 9, the writer of of 1 Peter says this, Be sober and be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a, while, suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. You see, when we are mature, we start to understand that temptation is real and we learn the only way to stay ahead of it is to resist it. Because whatever you resist in your life will get weaker. Whatever you submit to in your life will get stronger. 
And so the way to, to, to stay away from carnality, the way to not live as a carnal Christian is to stay ahead of it by learning the reality of temptation and what it means to resist the devil. In James 1 verse 12, I'll read out of the Amplified, it says this, Blessed, happy to be envied is the man who is patient under trial and stands up under temptation. For when he has stood the test and been approved, he will receive the victor's crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. You see, enduring also means going through a time of temptation. Without letting it change your attitude and commitment to God. Temptation's not bad. It's only bad when you yield to it. Can you say amen? And I know what happens. This one young guy said to his pastor, he said, Pastor, I don't understand it, you know. Temptation's an amazing thing. The minute I yield to it, it goes away. <laughs> and that's the whole point. You're not supposed to yield to it. You're supposed to resist it because it builds character into your heart. Jesus understands exactly what we're facing when we're tempted. And the only way you and I can have everything Jesus wants us to have is that we need to learn and we need to grow in maturity by standing strong through the trials of life. I've discovered this, that very often, while temptation doesn't come from God, God often uses temptation in our lives to show us the areas we're still weak in. And you know, when we can be real about that, when we can learn that through the grace of God, we can resist things in our lives and we can get stronger, we can overcome those weaknesses that would try and trip us up and stop us from moving forward. And then finally, number seven, Paul starts to close chapter three and he reminds you and I of our heavenly citizenship. How many of you know we are heaven bound? Heaven is our real home. And, and Paul wants to remind us of that uh, as a final encouragement in this journey of life with God. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3 and we'll read verses 20 and 21. He says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, he starts to put our attention away from the things of this world, and he gets our attention and our focus towards our heavenly calling, towards our citizenship. He says, listen, man, you're in this world, but you're not of this world. Your citizenship isn't on this earth. Your citizenship is in heaven. That's where you're registered. That's where you live from. That's where your king is. And he goes on in verse 21, he says, Who will transform our lowly bodies that it may be conformed to his glorious body? He says, how's this transformation going to take place? According to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. If I can just put that into Larry's English, it simply means this. If you will stay eternity-minded, if you will keep your mind focused on who you are in Christ and where you're going, it doesn't matter what you face in this world. It doesn't matter how difficult it gets. It doesn't matter how dark it looks. You have the light in you. And Christ in you and I is the hope of glory. Can you say amen? So let's keep preaching the word. Let's keep living for Jesus. And let's remember that our citizenship is in heaven. Jesus said it so beautifully in John chapter 14. And uh, I'll close with this, uh, these few verses this morning. He says this, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you to myself that where I am, there you may also be. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. 
As we close this morning, can I finally just say this? God is not limited. Heaven is not in lockdown. And you have not been locked out of God's kingdom or out of heaven. Heavenly things are available to you and I because we do not just live in a natural kingdom. We live in a spiritual kingdom that is alive and powerful and God we serve is all-knowing. He knows exactly where you are and what you need this morning. So let's pray for those who are in our spiritual incubator this morning as we begin to pray and close this service. Father, we want to thank you today that your word says in Matthew 9, 38, so therefore pray that the Lord of the harvest will force out and thrust laborers into the harvest field. For the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Father, I pray today for laborers. I pray for those who will be used of you to tell others about the goodness of God and about the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, their Savior. I pray for every person whose name's in this jar. And I pray right now that they will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that their lives will be changed and turned around in Jesus' name. And right now, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if you're under the sound of my voice today and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I would love to pray for you and I'd love to lead you in the prayer of salvation. Romans 10 verse 8 to 10 simply says this, if you'll believe in your heart and you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. So if you're there today and there's a tugging on your heart right now, then if you'll simply pray this prayer out aloud with me, you can be saved today. Let's pray. Father, I believe in my heart today that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died for my sins, and that You raised Him from the dead so that I could be saved. I open my mouth and I believe in my heart today and I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Father, in this moment, I want to pray for any person who is perhaps backslidden. And I pray right now that by Your Spirit, by Your goodness, and through your presence, you will draw them back to you. Lord, I break the power of bondage and strongholds and addictions that might be holding people back right now. And I release them in the name of Jesus Christ because your grace supplies and is sufficient for every need. I thank you right now, Father, if there's any person who wants to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that right now, wherever they are, that, Father, as they open their mouth, as they gently receive your love, right now, in, in Father, in Jesus' name, they will receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And I pray right now, if there be any sick person who is hearing the sound of my voice right now, I pray in Jesus' name, that healing will flow through their bodies and that by the stripes of Jesus, they will be healed. Thank you so much for participating in the service today. If you gave your heart to Christ, if you'd like to know more about what it means to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, or if you'd like to share a testimony with us, there's an email coming up on the screens right now, info at ramasouthcoast.com. Would you send us an email? We would love to hear from you. If you have any other questions about our church, you can go to our website, rfcfc.com, and you can find out all our information there. Remember, God loves you, and you are going to make it. Amen.